Welcome to the Debrief for the week of February 19th, 2018. I am your co-host. My name is Seth Ressler. And I am Mike Jeter. What's going on, Mike Jeter? Brother, I am happy, just over the top. It's it's because you saw Black Panther, isn't it? I know it. No. <laughs> Come no, on. Part of it. Part yeah. of it. No, I'm just happy to be here, man. This is another episode of the debrief, bruh. It is. And and it's gonna be a good one too. We got we, we got a we got a chalk full slate of guests here. I mean, we've got uh, Dr. Denarius Hemphill, who's got this big event that's going on at the Ch- Black Tie Gala going on at the Charles Wright Museum. That means Friday fancies. Night. It does. I don't, I don't even know if I own a black tie. I might have to <laughs> dip mine in paint or something. I don't know. Uh, we also have the editor of Eater Detroit, Brianna Houck's going to be here. We're going to talk uh, all about the food scene going on in Detroit. There's a lot of stuff going on with restaurants in this scene, uh, including James Beard Awards. Uh, semi-finalists were just announced, I believe, and we'll find out all about that. Plus, I got an opportunity this week to talk to uh, a lot of people on a serious topic. Uh, There is a new documentary film called Break the Chain. It is all about human trafficking. Uh, It is made by uh, a woman here uh, in Michigan. Her name is Laura Swanson, so we'll talk to her. And we'll also talk to uh, Ellis Stafford, who's the deputy director for the Detroit Crime Commission, and Noelle Schieffer, who's the president of Junior League of Birmingham. They are both very involved in human trafficking and and the efforts to uh, stop that so we'll talk to them about that plus we've got all your concerts comedy movies plays uh, and more all good stuff that we have every single week that's coming up in just a bit the quest for a co-host i love that i, love that. <laughs> <laughs> I do man Seth goes the extra mile, people, for this show. <laughs> you all should be sharing this with 20 other people, because that's how awesome this show is, how awesome Seth is. I like Good to break stuff, out man. the sound effects, you know? Uh, look, we've been talking about this for a couple weeks now. We need a co-host on this show, uh, and so we've invited a number of different people in to kind of audition and hang out with us and uh, see if they like us and, and have some fun. We've got somebody with us today. is a comedian who's been around for a long, long time, experienced guy, Mark Sweetman. Thanks for joining hey, us. Hey, Mark Sweetman. Great to be here. How yeah. are you? Man. I have some radio in me too. Uh, yeah, so you do, right? You've yeah. done some broadcasting yeah. in your time. Yeah, I used to. Uh, I used to. I got my uh, start as a radio and broadcast caster at uh, Wayne State University. W A Y N five sixty on your dial. I think it was or five forty. I can't. Back remember. when they were the Tartars, right? <laughs> the tar- we were the Tartars. The Tartars. Now I, that's something I don't understand why Wayne State doesn't hold on to that Tartar because they could sell yeah. two T-shirts and they could have the Warriors Tartar shirt, and then for the older uh, alumni, you could have the Tartar T-shirt. Right. I like tartars. Anyway, uh, my um, my mentor there was uh, Hal Youngblood, who was a producer at WJR, and he got me in as an internship there. And I worked on J.P. McCarthy's morning show, and then I was uh, a writer for the afternoon talk show uh, Focus, which was a live studio audience show, which was I think was the last one in Detroit. Seth and I were talking about this earlier. It was one of the last. In fact, I bet that studio's still up there. I mean, they haven't moved. Maybe they'll let us do it there. We need a live studio audience for this show. I think that would be cool. That would be cool. But we'll end up like Jerry Springer, though. You think so? Yeah, there'd be a whole lot of Seth, (laughs) Seth, or whatever. I'd be into that. (laughs) (laughs) What was great about it was when I was there, and I was there in 82 and 83, they had live announcers still. And they had, yeah. So you'd see some guy. He'd come in. He'd have his paper. He'd sit down on a chair and go, live from the studios of the Fisher Building in Detroit, Michigan, it's J.P. McCarthy's Focus. And then they'd play the music, and he'd go... And he'd get up and go out and, 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 he, and he'd go to and he'd go to his desk. He'd wait for the next live, and he didn't even write the stuff. Somebody else had smoke a pack of camels. You know that's a union job, so that pays yeah. well. Yeah, yeah. 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 Smoke a pack of camels, do a couple uh, <laughs> exactly. shots of bourbon. So, what about stand up comedy? Because you've been doing that for a long time. Stand up comedy. I started. We were talking about this the other day. I was down in the corridor, Midtown. They call it now. <laughs> us old timers remember the corridor, right. and uh, it's an art collective now next to Avalon Bakery, but they're used to be a bar there, a famous jazz bar called Cobb's Corner. Hmm. And um, between, I was down there, um, it was my senior year in high school, and I went down there on Devil's Night. And uh, everybody that's old as I am remembers that Devil's Night was a place where the city would light up. But this was 1977, and uh, Cass Corridor was also sponsoring a Star Wars night because the first Star Wars film was out. So I went down to Detroit, 
uh, I was with some old friends from the basketball team in high school who had gone to Wayne State. They had me stay in their dorm, went to classes with them. That night, they took me bar hopping in the Cass Corridor. And so now, anybody that remembers the Cass Corridor in the late 70s, uh, all the uh, Motown had left, all the big rockers like Alice Cooper and the Stooges and all the, you know, uh, the romantics, all of them had made it big and were out of the corridor now, but they all started down there. And um, Paradise Valley had closed and they made I-75 out of it. So there were a lot of uh, soul and R&B clubs or a lot of country music. So it was like a really eclectic area to get involved in. And we were, we were tooling these bars and we got to, we got to Cobb's Corner. And uh, Ron English was there, great guitarist, still plays today, like in his 80s. And, um, and he, uh, we, one of the drunk friends I was with says, hey, my, my friend is very funny. Can he get up between and tell the jokes that he's telling at our table between your sets? And they got me up, and I just told him the stories that I was telling him about how funny I thought it was that the town was burning down and we're applauding Star Wars characters on the streets. I just thought that was <laughs> – well. anyway, I did, I did what, what was probably three or four minutes, what seemed like 20 minutes to me, you know, and I, I probably got a smattering of applause, but I thought I killed, and right. that, was, that was enough to keep me going. Well, of course. All right, Mark, well, hang out. We're excited that you're here with us today. Thank you so much yeah, for coming, man. and uh, we're going to have a lot of fun today. He's one of my faves. Yeah, uh, absolutely. One of uh, my personal faves. <laughs> stick around in just a few minutes. We're going to talk about something you know very well, the uh, comedy shows that are coming to town. The Deep Green History Lesson. All right, Mark, here's how we do it. Uh, I am not from this area All originally. Right. I've only lived nope. here about two and a half, three years. Well, well, I have to turn up truck yesterday. Now, except for those 10 years in Los Angeles, I've only lived. Oh, you're a native. Yeah. You're from here originally. I am not only from here, uh, I go back quite a few generations. My, uh, my uh, grandfather, I have a grandfather Simpson on my mother's side. So uh, Grandpa Francis Simpson actually bought property west of Grand Boulevard. A oh. very risky thing to buy property west of Grand Boulevard. I, I don't know what that means. Explain what... Uh because uh, I'm new enough. I don't that know. <laughs> <laughs> you can date us all. What's the significance of that? Well, it would be like saying today you'd buy property west of US 23. In other words, it was way out there. Oh, there was just nothing. Uh, there was just there. nothing out he there. Was, there was, why are settling. you buying property out there? Right. You know? Oh, gotcha. <laughs> Michigan didn't, it didn't have a thumb at that time. It was just, <laughs> it was just one of some amalgamous thing, and it was just yeah. spread it out. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, because I'm new, at the end of every podcast episode, Mike gives me some homework. He, okay. he tells me something I got to go learn about and uh, do my homework and come back. And you're going to fall in love with this place. Yeah, it's like, it's like a book report. I'm starting to know. Like, I'm getting pretty good here. I'm like he a is. Michigan encyclopedia. Salt mines and everything else, man. You're pretty good. <laughs> Did you go into the salt mines? Uh, no, you can't at, the, at this point. Uh, oh, they well, used, they used yeah. to do tours. Well, you can't legally. <laughs> oh, you know a back door, maybe. <laughs> uh, back door to the salt mines sounds like a pretty good horror movie, too. No, no. You know, yeah. You know, my wife, my, my wife and I, and I'm not going to say where it is, but my wife and I went by the train tunnel that goes over to Windsor. Yeah. And my wife says, you know, they don't really block that off, do they? I, go, I don't think they do. Oh, wow. She goes, I wonder if the, uh, I wonder if the uh, National Security Administration knows about this. I go, I'm not going to say anything. I'll just wait till I get on a podcast and mention it, that it doesn't look like the, trains, the train tunnel to Windsor is blocked off. Uh, all right, Mike, what was my homework for this week? <laughs> uh, your homework was to go and find out about the... Uh, the devilish Nain Rouge. Oh, the Nain Rouge. The Nain Rouge. Yeah, I didn't know about this at all. Do you know about this, Mark? You yep. know what this guy? Yep. So, so it's, I guess it's a small creature. It's like an imp or like a uh, like, like a dwarf or something. Uh, supposedly has red or black fur covering it. Uh, an animal's body, but the face of an old man and blazing red eyes and rotten teeth. I work for that guy. <laughs> <laughs> But he always shows up before bad stuff happens. He's an omen. He's an yes. he's he's overture to like, the like, bad stuff. Like, you know, like S is going to about to hit the fan. Oh, kind of okay. thing. So, uh, and, and over the years, this has happened throughout Detroit. I guess uh, 1701 was supposedly the first time. Uh, you know, the um, Nain Rouge supposedly attacked Antoine de la Moth. Cadillac, am I pronouncing that yes, right? That I'm is working correct. on my French. That is correct. I come from California. All I know is Spanish. It's very different. <laughs> uh, but that was the French founder of the fortress, which later became Detroit. Detroit. Yeah. You know, yeah, Detroit. So uh, uh, he was there, 1763. Apparently, he showed up before the Battle of uh, Bloody Run, where 58 British soldiers were killed by Native Americans from Chief Pontiac's Ottawa tribe. Do you know that story? No. Oh, that's a great. Are you going to give this as a homework assignment? No, or go ahead. Go story? ahead. <laughs> Chief Pontiac, um, who legend has it is buried up on Apple Island on or- in, or- in the middle of Orchard Lake, um, came here with his Ottawa uh, tribe, and they start. 
they started playing lacrosse outside of the fort. And, of course, they did it until they got the attention of the British soldiers who were standing over the um, – Oh, on the on the top of the guard there, and they start watching this game. They start getting involved, with it, and they start placing bets, or whatever or whatever you do when you're guys watching a sporting event. You know, they probably got a beer or something. Who knows? But so um, every once in a while, a ball would go um, into the fort, and they would send a squaw in. They send one of the women in, and uh, she would go in, retrieve the ball, and come back out. Well, they were all dressed in these wraparound dresses or these, these uh, robes or whatever. And so then um, the next time, uh, two would go in, and they would come uh, well, well, pretty after they had done this a number of times and they saw that the British weren't paying attention, then all of the women with these robes came in, right? And following behind them were all the lacrosse players. They dropped their robes, the robes were covering their weapons. And the, and the Pontiac, uh, Chief Pontiac's tribe of Ottawa Indians <laughs> grabbed all these weapons and massacred Wow. The British, but that was their Trojan horse, was playing this lacrosse game. Wait a minute, get you. It doesn't matter. <laughs> That's why I don't play lacrosse. You don't mess with Pontiac either. <laughs> <laughs> That's my hometown. They know it's my hometown. Uh, That's very funny. So he shows up at other times between the before the uh, Detroit fire that happened in 1805, the War of 1812, uh, you know, the, uh, the the riots, the rebellions of 1967. Uh, 1976, I guess there was a huge snowstorm here. Yeah, major, major snowstorm. It's legendary. Okay. That might be like a future feet. homework. Wow. <laughs> feet uh, of snow. Well, two utility workers are said to have seen what they thought was a child climbing a utility pole and then jumping from uh, top of the pole and then ran away as they approached. But we think maybe it was the Nain Rouge. Yeah, weed was stronger back then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then in 2000. World child. Who can tell the difference? <laughs> you know? In a snowstorm at that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then in 2010, they actually started the uh, the Marche de Nain Rouge. Uh, they launched that, which is this big, it's a big march. It's a big parade that goes down Cass Corridor, and people wear costumes, and there's floats. And the idea is to march it out of town so that there isn't, uh, you know, all kinds of bad stuff going on. Uh, it's happening March 25th this year. Uh, so if yeah, people want to go down there, yeah, that would that would be a lot of fun. Uh, people, <laughs> I, I looked at the photos. People wearing costumes, you know, all dressed in red. It, honestly, it looks a lot like the Dirty Show. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I'm an old looking dude. I just need to put on a red or black. And just... there you go. <laughs> they, they still do the Dirty Show at the Russell Industrial Center. Oh yes. yeah, Did just that... happened. I just I was looking through the photos today. Now where are they doing? Where are they doing this parade on March 25th? Uh, I, it's it's Cass, Cass Corridor. Cass Corridor, Cass Corridor yeah. consists of about three roads, though. I wonder if they. No. We'll have to go. We'll yeah. have to go see. So, right. uh, so there it is. That's my homework. Good job, man. Good yeah, job. I'm, I mean it's a little scary, but you know I'm okay. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to scare the crap out of you, so <laughs> you'd have nightmares. You know, if anybody can, if anybody can catch that little rascal, it's probably be worth something. Uh, you think? You know, you like catching a leprechaun. Yeah, <laughs> I, I would. So here's how it works, uh, Mark. I, Mike gives me homework. I return the favor. I give him a pop quiz. Uh, oh, okay. So I have three statements. Two of them are true. One of them is false. He's got to figure out the false one. Are you guys ready? Mm-hmm. Ready. <laughs> I love that music. Statement number one. Detroit hip-hop artist Trick Trick recorded a battle rap song called Revenge of the Nain Rouge, in which the Red Imp defeats rival rappers Trick Daddy, Young Berg, and Rick Ross. Statement number two. In 2015, Woodbury Wine, an importer of French and Italian wines, both based out of the metro Detroit area, introduced Nain Rouge Red. And statement number three. In Marvel Comics, a supervillain named Nain Rouge is the primary antagonist of the Great Lakes Avengers in its 2016 run. One of those is correct? One of, no, two of those are actually true. One of them is false. So I don't know if you, you, I don't, you have any inkling? You, you yeah, totally... I yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. <laughs> All right, well, hold on to it. We're not going to answer it now. We'll come back at the end of the show. We'll, yeah. see, if, uh, we'll see if you guys know what's going on. Coming there it up. Is. There is a black tie gala that's going to be happening at the Charles Wright, and we will talk to the guy who's putting it on. Welcome to the D. Free D. D. Free. Funny stuff. Mike, what's going on in the comedy clubs? All right, this Friday, February 23rd, at Big Tommy's Comedy Club in Novi. Jay Stevens will be there Thursday through Friday. Uh, Fox Theater. 
Daily Show host, Trevor Noah, is in town. Yeah. Yeah, he's going to be here kicking it at the Fox on Friday and at the Soundboard, Cedric the Entertainer. But it's a special private event. Oh, so you can't I don't go. know what that means. That, that means you're not invited. That's what that means. That means only people with the name The Entertainer. In yes. It. Right, <laughs> yes. Cedric the Entertainer, Blaine the Entertainer. Uh, Latrice, anyway. Um, <laughs> on Saturday the 24th at the Michigan Theater in Ann Arbor, Ron Tater White. I'm a big fan. Tater. Yeah. He is funny. I would love to go see that. He'll be there on Saturday. Also this weekend at Mark Ridley's Comedy Castle, Mike Paramore is coming to town uh, this fr- Thursday through Saturday. And on Friday, it's another installment of Mike Bonner's Uptown Friday Night. Mark, let me ask you. Great show. Uh, Great show. The, you, yeah, the, the, Mark, the, the Uptown, Mike Bonner show? The, oh, man. I that haven't is, been to one yet. I got to go. No, it's a lot of fun, man. It's the best audience in town. Yeah. It is very diverse yeah. Yeah. audience yeah. because he, he brings a lot of uh, urban, quote unquote, urban comics up to the uh, suburbs to Royal Oak, past Eight Mile. Let me ask you: You've seen Mark Ridley's because that club's been around forever. Yeah, uh, it, it must have changed and evolved over the years. And well, yeah, it's it, um, the least amount of change has been since he got this current location in about '91 or something like that. But this is what it's fourth. Different uh, location. One, two, three, four, five, six. This is his seventh location. Jeez. Wow. Yeah. Well, lucky number and, seven. Yeah, and, and various and sundry business partners and, you know. Uh, Maybe he's the Nain Rouge. What do you think? Yes. <laughs> Every time the Nain know. Rouge shows up, there's a new comedy cast. Yes. <laughs> well, as far as comics go, he's he's pretty well renowned as one of the best guys in the business because it's a pretty sleazy business but he's 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 straight and he's good and he you know he does well by you and he doesn't uh you know he's, he's a man of his word and he's a good guy you know yeah. everybody likes him and i guess that's why we still work for him for the same amount we worked for him 20 years ago <laughs> <laughs> All right. At the Ann Arbor Comedy Showcase, Ellie Hardy. You may have seen him on Fox's Laughs or uh, MTV or BET. He's been on a lot of different things. He'll be there in Ann Arbor uh, at the Punchline Comedy Lounge in Southfield. Benji Brown and Friends. They'll be there Thursday through Sunday. And at the Holly Hotel, the Dave Dyer and Steve Lynn. Oh, that's a great show. Yeah, Yeah, they'll be there Friday and Saturday. Benji Brown and Friends? It's not an animal act, is it? Is uh, gonna I don't know. <laughs> They're not going to have like, they like a, put a little barrel up there and have a dog jump on top of it or something like that. All right, coming up in just a few minutes, stick around because we'll talk about what's happening on stage in the theaters. D, brief. Want more? Text the word to Detroit <laughs> to the number 444-999. All right, Mike and Mark. I like saying it that way. It's nice to have uh, it's nice to have two co-hosts with similar yeah, games. Yeah, man. <laughs> uh, hey, we have a very special guest dropping by the studio uh, with us today. It is Dr. Denarius Hemphill. He is uh, putting together this fantastic event that's happening this Friday night, February 23rd at the Charles Wright. It is a night of impact and celebration, a big black tie gala. Welcome, Doc. Hey, thanks for having me, man. What up, Doc? <laughs> What's up, man? <laughs> People call you Dr. D. Is that what it is? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I like Dr. D, even, but most times people call me Dr. D. I'm I'm not gonna lie. I was expecting somebody much older because we looked at Man. your resume. I'm, right, I'm looking at this resume. And I'm going, okay, this guy has what five degrees? Oh he has God. a degree in horticulture. <laughs> he has a degree in astronomy. <laughs> He's got degrees and degrees. I'm like, what is this man? And you come in here, you're like, hey guys. I'm like, what? <laughs> So let's talk about this event, this Black Tie Gala that's going on. What's happening at the Charles Wright Friday night? Man, um, Friday night is going to be explosive. I'm just, I'm just telling you guys right now. So um, on Friday night, um, Impact Leadership Academy is having this big gala that we're going to take a moment and honor some of our impactful leaders within the metropolitan Detroit area. But we're also going to take a moment and honor uh, one of our nonprofit organizations that's, that's, that's leading the way and truly defining the importance of what impact is and what it means to be impactful. So uh, we are going to take a moment and honor and celebrate the Mariners Inn that's um, actually in the city, in the heart of Detroit. So I, I want to walk through each of those elements one by one, starting with Impact. That's your organization, right? Yes. Yeah, so Impact is a nonprofit uh, mentoring program that seeks to engage, empower, and equip the now and next generation of progressive leaders here in the metropolitan Detroit area. So what does that mean? I, I mean? Tell me what are you guys actually working on? So what happens is that, you know, in, in, in the in this state of Michigan, we have our top performing schools, and then we have our low um, performing schools. So th- we have this bottom five list. So you will always have a bottom five, and those bottom five schools that within our 
metropolitan Detroit area, men, uh, Impact actually go to those schools and mentor our at-risk youth to um, just to help to help them with self-esteem, uh, help them with educational um, goals, and just it's just that one-on-one mentorship. And if we can really just at that moment can see Impact in full full power, full of what it is, individuals making progressive achievement and continuing transformation. All right. How long have you been uh, doing this? I've been doing this about three or four years now. Okay. Wow. Where do you find your mentors? Um, well, most times they are just colleagues from um, college, um, people, I, other young people that I have grew up with, um, and we just love and enjoy doing what we're doing, um, just helping others. Mark, you want a mentor? I could use a mentor. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you can use one, right? Don't let this guy fool you. He's he's had a lot of practice. He's got uh, like. Uh, eight how kids? many? Seven? Eight kids? Eight, eight wow. children. Oh, eight. Wow. Yeah, so he knows what he's doing. He's, uh, he's And notice, notice, he said children. He didn't <laughs> <Right>. say kids. <laughs> Just so you know, he's serious about that. <laughs> Me, well, I'm like, I got three, four, yeah. maybe. I don't know how many kids. <laughs> yeah, I, got, I, I got four adults. So, right. I mean, right. uh, they're, not all, okay. they're, not all, right. they're not all kids anymore, So, but they're still my children. Yeah. And, and you've got this Keeper of the Dream Award. Yes. So... So the Keeper of the Dream Award is going to seven individuals, some of our prominent leaders within our um, community, um, Gail Perry Mason, um, um, the Honorable um, Judge and Pastor Donald Coleman, who, um, who work at 36. Mm-hmm. Um, we have uh, Mr. Antoine J- um, Johnson um, and, and um, Dr. Truman Hudson Jr. And this list can go on and on and on, but they are doing some impactful things in our community. Um, and, and, hey, I just want to just take a moment and celebrate them. Oh, that's See, awesome. I dig that, man. Yeah. And this is the first year you're doing this, this correct? This is my first year doing something of this magnitude. Man, I dig it. I dig it. One thing I realized is that this, uh, when it comes down to impact, impact is bigger than uh, than one individual. It's the uh, it's it's basically the the brainchild of people coming together and creating an impact together. Yeah. And tickets are fifty dollars, and yes. all the profits are being donated to Mariners Inn. Yes. So, tell us a little bit about who that is. So, Mariners Inn is a um, is a men's shelter in the heart of Detroit downtown. And um, every year, I around Christmas time, I end up doing something special, um, donating clothes, donating socks. Like this year, I donated about one hundred and twenty socks. Uh, I love socks. <laughs> I love socks. Uh, he's styling people. <laughs> they matching. That's, right. that's sixty pairs, right? Yeah. So, it's not like right. the one. Mine match the one, one holding left over. <laughs> so yeah, every year I do something. I, I try to do something impactful, just to, um, just to bless uh, other people. So they are cr- currently uh, helping people, uh, helping other young men in the, uh, in our community to um, rec- from recovering addicts to um, people who just need some some type of support, mentorship, and things of that nature. So I I am honored to have the opportunity to honor those who are who are at the grassroots movement and making these sustainable change in our community. See, and I dig that, man. I dig that. Even all the education and success that you've had personally, you feel uh, you feel motivated. You yes. feel like that is your destiny to help out people that are less fortunate. Yes. And, and yeah, and I commend you, man. This is this is outstanding. This is outstanding. I really would like to attend this. I got to see if I've got a black tie in my closet. I don't know if I do. This is uh, a little get, better than I usually dress. On I Friday get night. you. If you need a tie, I, oh, get, right. I, I, get, I get the ties and the socks. <laughs> but he, he didn't mention he doesn't have any collared shirts. Okay, so he's just going to wear a t-shirt well, look, with a tie on it. Is this is come as you are. I'm, I'm five foot four. It's going to be dragging on the ground. You know that, right? Is this going to be in the museum? Is this going to be in the museum's theater? Um, it's actually so when you walk inside the, um, the museum, it's in the Rotunda. Okay. So the very oh, open cool. space. Oh, yeah. cool. Right, right. Okay. All right. Cool. Well, cool. Well, that's happening Friday night. If people want to go get tickets, where do they go? Um, they actually can go to um, Dream Maker, Dream Keeper, Event Bright, and, um, and that's the first and only event that's going to pop up for that day. Nice. Uh, it's a night of impact and celebration, Black Tie Gala, happening this Friday, February 23rd at the Charles Wright. Uh, Dr. Denarius Hemphill, oh, man. thank you so much for stopping by. Yes, thank you, sir. Thanks, you guys, for having me. I, I'm, hey, I'm really excited about being here. Awesome. <laughs> All right, stick around in just a bit. We're going to talk about the new human trafficking documentary. This is the Deep Brief. On stage. Let's take a quick look at what's going on in theaters around town. City Theater has Musical Thrones, a parody of Ice and Fire. Hmm. 
Game of Thrones feels like it's right for parody, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. It has been. It's wackadoodle like that. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Detroit Public Theater has Marie and Rosetta. Uh, This is about Sister Rosetta Tharp. We talked to them in the last episode. Uh, I thought that was really interesting. So uh, go check that out. Uh, Detroit Rep has Dauphine Island. Matrix Theater Company has Big Red Button. It's a comedy about World War III because World War III just gets funnier every single (laughs) day. Especially as we approach it. (laughs) Uh, It's tragedy plus time. Yes, exactly. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Meadowbrook Theater in Rochester has Tenderly, the Rosemary Clooney story. Michigan Opera Theater has Shen Yun. I don't know if you've seen this. I saw three billboards outside of Ebbing, Missouri. That's how I know. (laughs) (laughs) And 70 more all over town. Uh, Mosaic Theater has Animal Farm. Music Hall has... Oh, an ants presented by Puppet Art. Puppet Art's uh, still finding a home there at Music Hall. I know that they got kind of moved out by, they got priced out of downtown, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, pup, again, Puppet Art is another Detroit thing. Right. I mean, you see more. When I was a kid growing up, there were a lot of puppet theaters. Oh, really? And, oh, yeah. We, my, uh, my folks and my grandfolks would bring us downtown all the time. They didn't have PlayStation back then. That's right. We didn't have PlayStation back then. <laughs> they weren't all chasing we uh, Pokemon and stuff. And... They only had three stations. They were all black and white. <laughs> and we were happy with it. You know. I, I want to go see one of these puppet art shows. I haven't seen one yet. So I want to go check it out. Seth, if you go, I'll go. All right. Sounds good. I'll get drunk first. <laughs> but... but we'll go. <laughs> we'll go. Open Book Theater in Wyandotte has Vanya and Sonya and Masha and Spike. That's opening this weekend. The Ringwald Theater in Ferndale has Merrily We Roll Along. Uh, Slipstream Theater Initiative in Ferndale has Tartuffe opening this weekend. Uh, this is a famous comedy uh, by Molière. It was first performed in the year 1664, but they've actually reimagined it and set it in very early Detroit. Oh, nice. Yeah. Uh, Stagecrafters in Royal Oak has Bug opening this weekend. Tipping Point Theater. It is the last weekend to see this. Every brilliant thing. You have to go see it, people. I saw it a few weeks ago. I can't stop raving about it. I, I might go back point? and see it. Yes. Oh. It, it's it's a fantastic, give fantastic a, play. Give us a quick review. Uh... It's fantastic. (laughs) Most reviewers have a little bit about it without giving away the story. Uh, I was actually, I actually took part in it. Now, how did that because happen? it's it's an interactive play, so audience certain audience members are given cards to read, uh, because the the play is about a, a kid who wrote down all of these brilliant things, these cool things that makes life worth living. Wow! So. You know, I had to read, and I also played his uh, his college professor. And I did it well, because I'm an actor. <laughs> Speaking of actors, two bits of news. Uh, first of all, hometown hero Jeff Daniels is going to play Atticus Finch in To Kill a Mockingbird on Broadway. Uh, and this is being adapted by Aaron Sorkin, who oh, did The wow. West Wing and oh. who did uh, Sports Night. Yeah, and one, of the best, one of the best dialogue writers in the business. Yeah, absolutely amazing. So uh, I, I'm excited to see that. I, I love yeah. both those guys. Uh, and also, this is unconfirmed, but the rumors are that Stormy Daniels uh, is going to be at the Detroit Strip Club Truth on March 14th. So if you uh, if you want to go in the, on her Agent Orange tour, is yes. that what she's calling it? <laughs> Coming up in uh, just a moment, we're gonna we're gonna take a look at the uh, the, the films, the movies that came out uh, are coming out. There's only one movie, Seth. Yes, the, I know. I know. <laughs> Come up. Uh, I know. I can guess what it's gonna be too. The deep breathe. All right, Mike and Mark, we got to get serious here for just a moment because there is a uh, there's a new documentary that's coming out. It's by a Michigan filmmaker. Her name is Laura Swanson, and it is called Break the Chain. It's going to be showing at Maple Theater in Bloomfield Hills on Tuesday, February 27th. Uh, it's all about human trafficking, which is actually a big deal here uh, in the state of Michigan and in the Detroit area. Uh, and so I actually had an opportunity to sit down and talk to her a bit about it. Uh, and really kind of get into her about what this film is all about. We sat down at a Starbucks. You're going to hear some of the background noise uh, from the interview. Uh, and I, my first question to her is, look, what is this documentary all about? Here's what Laura said. Break the Chain is a documentary film that is addressing the uh, hidden in plain sight issue of human trafficking that we have within Michigan communities. And it's also applicable to how human trafficking um, exists within the United States. It's really a film 
that's made so that individuals working in human trafficking on a daily basis can really show how the issue actually exists within society versus the sensationalized form that we typically get in media. So it's trying to break away from the traditional ways in which we see this issue to reveal how it actually happens in, in daily life. Yeah, because all I know about human trafficking really is what I see in movies and television. Like, mm -hmm. I, you know, uh, I mean, it's one of those things that you kind of get the senses everywhere, but I don't feel like I ever really see it. Well, being here in the uh, border city, uh, I know that Detroit has a major role in the uh, human trafficking game uh, in this country. So, yeah, this is, I mean, this is right on time, especially for this area. Yeah. Well, like she said, she wanted to really show people what it's all about. Uh, so I asked her, what's the biggest misconception about human trafficking? A lot of people assume human trafficking right away only is sex trafficking. That's mainly what we see. Uh, sex trafficking, sex, as you know, is very, very sellable. Like people identify more with victims of sex trafficking than they do labor trafficking for whatever reason. And so this is actually showcasing labor trafficking in addition to sex trafficking, which hardly ever gets any attention. Yeah, I mean, when I think of human trafficking, I think of like like one of my favorite television shows is The Wire, and, mm -hmm. and this was an issue that they got into in season two of The Wire. But it was sex trafficking. I mean, labor trafficking. That's slavery. Yeah, essentially. I mean, that yeah. that really is what it is. So and usually, you think you know it has a lot. I mean, I'm sure uh, females play a greater role in, in the trafficking as far as what's being trafficked or who's being trafficked. What do you mean they uh, play a greater role? Well, I mean, there are more of them. There are more women that are being sex trafficked than there are men. I mean, that's the assumption, right? I, I would assume just because guys are, you know, let's face it, probably more likely to go out and pay for, you know, young women. to Or young men. Yeah, or young men, but yeah. So, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, when it comes to labor trafficking, so, so the way this documentary works is she follows two uh, human trafficking victims. Uh, one is a labor trafficking victim and one is a sex trafficking victim. The labor traffic victim that she follows is a guy named Kwame. Uh, and she told me a little bit about him. Kwame is um, a survivor of labor trafficking. He was originally um, grew up in Togo. Well, part of his life he grew up in Togo. And one of his family friends decided that they wanted to bring him into the United States to give him a better life. That was the original, you know, emphasis behind everything of going to the United States. And so went to the United States, him and three other individuals, and instead of getting a better life, he ended up being essentially a domestic servant to his trafficker, the person that brought him over. Um, he had to do household cleaning and everything, clean his trafficker's friends within the United States. And if he didn't do everything that that individual wanted on a daily basis, he would get beaten and starved and locked in different, different places. Yeah, that's frightening. Yeah, that's definitely slavery. So it's still alive in this country to a certain degree. But you know there's some managers out there going, if only. Right. Yeah. Uh, you know, one of the things I wondered, especially, you know, being a filmmaker, is how do you even find, you know, how do you find somebody Talk to cab people? drivers. Yeah. <laughs> well, talk, uh, talk to bouncers. Talk to, I mean, go to the low, go to the low areas. Right. That's, even if they don't know those people, they go, do you know anybody that's, you know, just forced to work and can't leave, you know, there's usually somebody that knows. Right. You can find people. I mean, I you know, you can score drugs, you can score sex, you can score anything. You just have to know how low to go. Yeah. Well, I asked Laura how she did it. Uh, and she actually, I mean, yeah, she essentially said what you're saying. Here's what she said. The most difficult part of the filmmaking process was actually finding a labor trafficking survivor. I started my research by hooking up with, you know, different entities such as law enforcement, nonprofits, and task forces throughout Michigan that obviously work on this. And so I ended up going to various conferences throughout Michigan to not only learn and do research on the issue of human trafficking, but to see if there were any victims that sometimes they have victims at these um, conferences that speak about their story and help provide detailed information for law enforcement and some insight. I uh, met a ton of sex trafficking survivors that were really empowered and talking about their story, but I never found 
a labor trafficking survivor. So I was having difficulty. Um, I reached out to different farm workers, legal services. I reached out to Bridget Carr from the University of Michigan, who uh, runs the Human Trafficking Law Clinic, University of Michigan. And I asked, you know, is there a labor trafficking survivor? We had a couple people come forward and say they were labor trafficking survivors, but I would start talking to them and they all backed out. They would all be too afraid for a various reasons. Uh, one that, one reason that surprised me that was uh, unanimous amongst all the labor trafficking survivors we talked to is that they, f- they still were confused about how they were considered, um, you know, victims as it related to human trafficking because in their minds they were so used to it having been, you had to be raped and chained up and, and all that stuff for human trafficking. You know, they didn't have the knowledge that most of us, you know, have around the issue of human trafficking. So um, eventually Bridget ended up sending me an email and she said, I think this person's ready to speak. He's really hesitant, Um, you know, didn't happen that long ago, but, you know, maybe if you can work with him. And I'm very big on trying to come from a victim-centered approach because I've been a victim of sexual assault and domestic violence myself so I understand what it takes to share your story and how vulnerable that can be so I worked with Kwame for a while we went back and forth for three months and finally uh, he decided that he was ready for an interview but when we did his interview initially we um, blurred his face we were going to make him anonymous um, not have his name in anything um, just hear his story and and I was grateful to just get that much because I wanted labor trafficking so bad So when we produced the trailer and we sent it to him to view, he absolutely loved it and thought that we were doing a really great job. And he sent an email back and he said, you know what, I've thought about it. And because of what you guys did, I'm willing to reveal my identity. So let's go for it. It just makes you realize how difficult it must have been to make a film like this. Incredibly difficult. Yeah. I I mean, to... Yeah. I mean, it's heart wrenching, man, and, and especially in the climate that the country's in now. Even if um, these victims were discovered and were able, were set free, um, then you have the specter of possibly being sent back right. to your country and possibly getting right back into that whole that loop again. Because who knows what's waiting back home? You know, maybe it's someone who is very familiar and intimate with the person that uh, he was captured by. So, it, yeah, man, it's it's heartbreaking. Uh, well, like I said, it's not just labor traffic. She also follows a sex traffic victim. Uh, that is a woman named Debbie. And here's what Laura said about her. Debbie was really young, came from a home environment that wasn't very great. She ran away from home and one day when she was at the Jackson County Fair, an individual approached her and, you know, said that he cared about her, asked her how she was, like, you know, acted like he actually genuinely had an interest in her and then said that he would, you know, take care of her if she wanted. She's a runaway. What's she going to do? So she went with him. And after she went with him, the relationship turned into you need to start turning out tricks for me um, or else I'm going to take away your home. I'm going to take away this, you know, lots of violent threats and, you know, force, fraud and coercion um, in that. And so she ended up staying in that with him until she was around 18. He dropped her because she was too old for the market. And then... You know, what do you do at that stage uh, when you've only known how to survive based on turning tricks and doing that stuff? Um, I mean, she got addicted to drugs while she was being trafficked. So there's that aspect in there. So then she started working independently as a prostitute. Um, And so she did that for a number of years until she finally um, ended up getting help. Uh, and figuring out that there were resources and mental health resources there for her. But her trafficker ended up getting arrested, and they came to talk to her about, you know, does he have a trafficking ring? Because he was getting arrested for tax fraud um, and tax evasion and everything like that. And every single one of the girls that he had trafficked said, no and backed him up. And I think that just kind of goes to show that these individuals get into the get into relationships with their victims, um, manipulate them and make them feel so dependent on them that even when victims know that this individual has wronged them, it's really, really hard for them to 
separate themselves and they have like love for their traffickers um and it, it very much resembles domestic violence in that fashion you know the thing that she says wow. there that just uh, creeps me out is when she talks about being 18 being too old for the market is just wow man yeah 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 man that that just it sickens me yeah uh, all right. The last question I asked her is, you know, what does she want people to take away from the film when they watch it? Here's what she said. I want them to come away from this understanding how individuals um, get into a trafficking situation and how complex the crime is and that it's so easy for it to be hidden amongst us every day. And I guess the other thing is that we're connected to it in some way. Um, especially when you look in terms of labor trafficking. We're not doing enough on that front to think about the restaurants that we frequent, the clothes that we buy, the goods that we buy. We're not doing enough to try and figure out the transparency within our supply chains and decide who we buy from and everything to make sure that it's not connected to labor trafficking on some level. All right, so here's the deal. Uh, there's going to be a very special screening of this film. Uh, it's called Break the Chain, uh, and it is all about human trafficking in Michigan. That screening is happening Tuesday, February 27th at the Maple Theater in Bloomfield Hills. Uh, there's actually going to be Q&A uh, mm. with, with the director, with Laura there afterwards. Uh, tickets are $10, and all proceeds will benefit the Detroit Crime Commission's Anti-Human Trafficking Initiative. Uh, they also want you to please bring some gently used teen clothing uh, and full-sized hygiene products that'll be donated to uh, Vista Maria, which go to help victims of human trafficking. Now, we're actually going to come back to this in a few minutes uh, and, and get into this issue a little bit more because this is not the only person I talked to about this this week. Uh, I also talked to the deputy director of the Detroit Crime Commission as well as the president of the Junior League of Birmingham, uh, Michigan, both of whom are, are working very hard to uh, fight human trafficking. And we'll find out what they're doing and, and more about their efforts in just a moment. <laughs> Action. This is the G3. All on the screen. All right, Mike, what's going on in the movie theaters? Well, Seth, at the Main Art Theater, and that's in Royal Oak, Michigan, we have Phantom Thread, Call Me By Your Name, The Insult, Happy End, and on Friday and Saturday midnight, The Room. That's that movie that inspired the disaster artist from oh, last year. Oh, yeah. This yeah. is a This is really terrible. a truly hor- horrible <laughs> it's movie. It's supposed to be god-awful. Perfect for a late midnight <laughs> Friday or Saturday date. I'll be drunk anyway. Who cares? <laughs> that's, that's really what it's all there for. That's really what it's all there for. At the Maple Art, I'm sorry, the Maple Theater in Kitchen in Bloomfield, you have three billboards. They're they're starting to bring up these movies that are nominated for Oscars. Yeah, that's so three happens. billboards outside of Ebbing, Missouri. Uh, they're showing The Shape of Water, which I've heard is n- nothing but spectacular. Uh, the Darkest Hour, Call Me by Your Name, The Post, and Phantom Thread is also playing there. At the Repertheater Theater, look, man. If you want to get your Paul Newman on, oh, you oh. go, you go, you get you some uh, some dressing. Yep. Paul Newman's dressing. Uh, you go get a bag of spinach and pour that dressing in there. And then you go to the movies and eat the dressing out of the bag or the, the spinach out of the bag. Because uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, Friday is Cool Hand Luke. Oh, and- oh that's a great movie. Oh, that, is, that is the movie. What? We have here. Oh boy! Is a failure to communicate. <laughs> oh boy! She just got to be named Lucille. <laughs> you look that good. You got to be named Lucille. Okay, many- everyone else go see it except for Mark and Seth. <laughs> How many hard-boiled eggs can you eat? <laughs> Not fifty. That's for sure. Well, that's on Friday night. On uh, Saturday night, you have HUD, and then on Sunday, Slapshot. That's a fave around here. That's Slash a good that's a weekend right there. Yeah, great great weekend of Paul Newman movies. Uh, at Cinema Detroit, you have Phantom Thread, Two Trains Running, and Poop Talk. We talked about that last week. Oh. That is still showing there. I don't know about this. Listen, I think it's spectacular. Poop, poop is doing an extended run. Oh. Yes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lord. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Good night. <laughs> okay, at the Beacon Park, inside of Heated Tents, on February 24th, that's uh, next Saturday, uh, you can go check out Despicable Me at 4 o'clock, or at 6 o'clock is Wonder Woman, and at 8 o'clock, Dunkirk. 
Ooh, I've been looking for an excuse to go see Wonder Woman. This would be a nice way to see it. Just go and spend all whole Yes, when it's freezing out. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> in heat well, the heat You're in heat intense. All right, yeah, let's. Yeah. Uh, I. This is all fine and good, but let's talk yeah, about the movie you really want to talk stuff, about. All right. They, they, the end all be all movie in the history of uh, cinema uh, came out last week, and um, the whole world's a buzz. Yes. Whole world. Black you, bo- you both saw it, I take it? I saw it. I yes. saw it. It's called, uh, or it's south of the border, it's uh, Pantera Negro. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I knew Spanish, did you? Uh, yeah, Black Panther, man. It's Cole crushing it. Cole crushing it. $387 million. That's it. It's opening it weekend worldwide. Yeah. It, made worldwide. Enough money, it made enough money to pay for itself. That's yeah. Like, everything's absolutely, profit. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. They set box office records here with the biggest February debut uh, ever with an estimated $202 million opening domestic domestically. And uh, it also made it the fifth largest opening ever. Uh, all the movies ever. Uh, the top, and it's the uh, top grossing film in history by a black director who is Ryan Coogler. You know, this cast is absolutely, absolutely. amazing. There's a lot of heavyweights in here. It is such a deep and layered movie, man. There's so much going on. We'll talk about it later. But there's so much going on in this movie. I'm sure you missed a lot. Well, I'm, I that, caught it all. That's why we're you. friends, so that you can explain it all to me. But yeah, it was incredible. What did you think? Uh, I loved it. You know, my favorite. I was what I was gonna say is this is an amazing cast. You know, I, I mean, I love everybody from Angela Bassett to uh, uh, Michael B. Jordan. But my favorite character was actually uh, T'Challa's little sister, who's played by uh, yeah, but by a woman who has is act, not been acting that long. She's relatively new on the scene. Oh, um, she was good. She was great. She was very good. Yeah. And I gotta say, man. Uh, <sighs> Michael B. Jordan, I I did not see him as the villain. I saw him more as a victim, and just a, he was just the antagonist. I didn't see him as a bad guy. Well, I th- they're saying that this is the most layered and complex, and and basically the best villain Marvel has ever had. Yes, because it was it was not one dimensional. He wasn't just like, oh, you you stole my plans, and now I got to be evil or whatever. He had he had a cool backstory, not a cool backstory. It's kind of sad, really, but. Uh, People just go see the movie. I don't need to talk anymore about it. You know, when I was on board was was very very early on. There is a you know that flashback to Oakland in the early nineties, yes. and I grew up in the Bay Area. And the music that's playing in the background is Too Short, which is mm-hmm. an Oakland artist that was, I mean, kind of like what Jay Dilla would be around here. Right. And it was so authentic. And of course, Kugel is from uh, he's he's from the Bay Area. He's from right. the Oakland area. So that's oh, how nice. we knew that. Yep. But it was just it, it was a nice touch. You know what I mean? I feel you. And uh, and I was on board ever since. Uh, All right. Go see that movie. Let's make it a trillion dollars. Absolutely. Go see it. And we're going to get back into the discussion of human trafficking uh, in just a few moments. This is the D. Brie. About last week. Mark, every uh, episode we do this this segment where we talk about basically what we've got going on last week. Oh, okay. Uh, you know, kind of uh, what we did, what what was cool, what was fun, what what we enjoyed doing. So, um, I don't know. We'll start with you. You're the guest. Uh, okay. Uh, what what you got going on? What are you um, working on these days? Uh, last week, my wife and I did a juice fast. <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> Ooh. Glad I asked. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and. Uh, and I like them. I mean, uh, so first, I, I appreciated that my wife did it with me because normally she takes the Michael Jeter role in the family whenever I do a fast, and she's uh, she's I'd never do that. Blah blah. And so but then she moon walks out of the room. Exactly. <laughs> and this time, this time she did it with me, and uh, you know I feel good. I, I checked my uh, I checked my bloods this morning. They went down. So my uh, glucose levels went down. So I'm happy about that. And I just have to you know I just have to keep the habits good. So my doctor wishes I would just cut out carbs and sugar altogether. But man, we're talking about rice, potatoes. What kind of evil pasta. person is that? It, it's hard when Bunny. He wants me to live. Yeah, but. He want- dude, I would make a mashed potato sandwich. That's just how much I love carbs and, and stuff. I would just take a. You got diabetes two in your family? So on a yeah, week when. I don't have it. <laughs> but on a week <laughs> when Punchkey Day was followed by Valentine's Day, you managed to start I a managed, juice fast. No, That's I pretty start, good. We started. It. Well, we started. It. We started Here you go, my love. Because I had juice. more chocolate and sugar last week. <laughs> well, because my wife was involved, I we we sort of tapered off, and then Thursday through Sunday was the heavy. All right. Was the heavy days, and then I broke it Sunday night. I felt good too, and I didn't feel good after I broke it. So I wish uh, maybe I'll do another one soon. Then do you have comedy projects in the works? Anything that you're? Uh... Uh, yeah, I'm working on. Um, 
as I have been probably since the time I got into it, um, I'm working on something to sell that uh, will you know allow me to retire or at least uh, at least move to the next level. Um, I don't need fame or fortune, but if you're going to move forward in this, you gotta you gotta do something more than just headline clubs. And I've been headlining clubs for. I don't know, 30 years now so um uh but when you say something to sell you're talking about script you're yeah, talking yeah, about yeah uh, yeah well i, I, I bitcoins I, I, bitcoins yeah <laughs> I, I don't want to jinx myself by talking about it and i'm not sure i'm in a position to talk about my partner uh he's out in hollywood but we're we've we've pitched a couple of things and we've gotten some great reaction back to it about how we can uh, about how we can sell it and which direction to go into and everybody says the same thing so look you know, we can't. I guess I can say you know, it was one of the big four networks, and the uh, the person there said, "Look, you know, we're not looking for this type of pro- uh, project right wait, now." Wait, hold on. Netflix, Hulu, Amazon Prime, or ESPN. Spotify, NBC, ABC, uh, oh, CBS. Oh, ESPN. oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, but they. But all you know, everybody out there says, "Look, I mean, everybody's looking to put in original." Content, right? You know, even uh, Facebook is going to put out a original content page. He goes, so you'll, he's, you know, my partner says it's not a matter. And when I say partner, I'm not going to mention any names yet until he tells me I can. Uh, we're talking about somebody that's produced movies, uh, been a showrunner on sitcoms. Uh, you know, Steven Spielberg. Yeah, exactly. See, I was Spielberg. just thinking that. So, or as well, I like to call him, Little Stevie. Anyway, <laughs> well, whomever it is, but anyway, it would be um, someone that want me on this project, right? Right. Uh, you know, I'm not going to forget my friends, but I'm also going to hire somebody to get in between you and me, right. so, <laughs> so that I can make them. Right. I mean, I could say, "Hey, brother," you know, I can play that role. <laughs> <laughs> Snap me some skin. You know, I can do all of that all day long. Uh, kids, Uncle Mike is here. <laughs> I can do it, children's. Yeah, no, this 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 came about. This came about. Neil Rubin. You guys know Neil Rubin. Yes, he wrote uh, columnist for the the news. He called me, and Neil and I have had a friendship for oh, twenty five. 25 years at least. And um, he's usually calling me up during a, a presidential election year because I'm always again, I'm always the one that can provide him with good first lady jokes. <laughs> For some reason, no, but not too many count. He goes, because you got anything on Laura Bush? You know, that, <laughs> but, but anyway, we've, we've kind of kept it. And then he's, and then I guess he saw something that I had written on a Facebook page and he kept it in the back of his head. And then one, maybe three or four years ago, he calls me up and he says, um, hey, you know that story you wrote about you know meeting your wife? He goes, I'd like to. He said, I'd like to make that a um, a Valentine's story for my Valentine's Day column. And I said, oh, that didn't happen on Valentine's Day. He goes, it doesn't matter. I said, I want to make it a Valentine's story. <laughs> and so uh, he goes, he goes, well, how did that actually come about? What's the story you tell? What's the story? You know, like if I ever told it on stage or not, and what's the what actually happened? And so I told him this story. He does an article on it. I get a call from um, somebody at in Miami, um, the same people that own the news, owned a paper down in Miami or something like that. So it got coverage in Florida, and by then it got picked up. And so this was it was just a cute story about how we fell in love. Had nothing to do with the fact that I adopted black, five black kids. Yeah, we haven't even talked about that. Yeah, really. Yeah, but 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 the picture he ran was my family, and so. Uh, and, and, and then he did mention in the story that we had adopted these kids. Doesn't mention until you, unless the story ran with the picture. I mean, nothing about that. It's just you know, East Side Detroit. I guess if you're from Detroit, you would know the East Side Detroit. They probably adopted black kids, but outside right. of the city, you'd know that. Anyway, um, there are people that still think that there's a South Detroit. So we get it. That's true. Know. That's true. <laughs> anyway, a long long story. Long story short, an old friend of mine who is now this person I'm talking about that's out in Hollywood that's been produced and and uh, has an inside track that I don't have. And I would have to find a partner of that because I'm too old to have to go through this again. Codename Steven Spielberg. So, Codename we'll Steven just, Spielberg. We'll just say that yeah, from now yeah, on. Uh, <laughs> well, let's just say, um, let's call him, um, let's call him uh, Steven Too True Spielberg. We'll All just call right. him that. Too True Spielberg. <laughs> Anyway, so we got together, and we we threw some ideas together. He says, well, don't do anything else. Let me pitch this. And so we pitched it, and, you know, it's it's on again. It's off again. But for about the last six months, it's been a heavy on again. We've been doing um, four-and-a-half-hour writing sessions on the phone. Wow. Yeah, me in Detroit and he in L.A. So. That's a lot wow. of work. Wow. Well, I don't know about you, Mike. I didn't pitch to any networks last week, so I think he wins. Yeah, <laughs> think really. He- well, it wasn't it – wasn't, it wasn't, it, 
it, it, the pitch didn't come last week, but I'm told now that it's not a matter. I have been told it's not a matter of if; it's a matter of when. So, well, says, well let us know what happens, and, yeah. and best of luck with it. Yeah. That's well. awesome. This is the deep breeze. You know, we talk a lot on this podcast about the resurgence of the city of Detroit uh, and all the good things that come with it, uh, but there's a dark side to it, too. And, and usually when we talk about it, Mike, on this podcast, we're talking about gentrification. We're talking about people getting priced out of certain mm-hmm. neighborhoods. But one of the other things that uh, is a real issue uh, is this human trafficking issue uh, because, you know, it follows the money. So as money comes back into Detroit, uh, so does human trafficking. Uh, and we talked earlier about the uh, film Break the Chain that is going to be uh, at the Maple Theater uh, on Tuesday, February 27th. Uh, but I didn't just sit down with the director. I also sat down with Ellis Stafford. He is the deputy director for the Detroit Crime Commission. Uh, and the way the Detroit Crime Commission works, this is, uh, you know, it's, it's privately funded. It is a separate organization from the police department, but it is there to help fill in the gaps and to address some of the things that, uh, you know, the police department can't handle. Uh, and I also sat down with Noelle Schieffer. She is the president of the Junior League of Birmingham, Michigan. Junior League is a volunteer organization. It's international. Uh, happens all over. Uh, but there is a Birmingham chapter. Uh, and I talked to them more because they both have a lot of efforts going on uh, in terms of fighting and battling and, and uh, both battling human trafficking, but also taking care of the victims uh, once they are out of human trafficking. So... I started by talking to uh, a deputy director, uh, Stafford, uh, about how the Detroit arts and entertainment scene breeds human trafficking. Here's what he told me. Look at what you have here in Detroit. You've got four professional sporting teams, all within a half mile or quarter mile of each other. You've got three of the largest motor car companies uh, on the face of the planet here. You've got numerous other uh, tier one uh, businesses located around the region. There's a lot of money around here in the state of Michigan in the, in, in the region. Some of these folks have tastes that they want satisfied that run from subtle to gross. It runs the gamut. And as long as you have somebody out there with disposable income, with a, with a taste that is perverted as it may be, you will always find somebody to try to satiate that taste. True. Yeah. So, uh, like you said, with the money coming in, I mean, this trouble is going to follow it. Well, and he would talk about, you know, he would talk about the auto show and he said, look, not to disparage the auto show at all. It's a great thing. It, it brings a lot of money into the city of Detroit, but it also brings this element in, into Detroit as these, you know, wealthy people come in to From all over the show. world. And, and he said they don't, you know, and then they, they go on. Then they go to the Final Four or, you know, they, then they go to the Super Bowl or then they go to wherever else the money goes. They just kind of follow it from place to place. So what the Detroit crime commission is trying to do is they're they're actually trying to use data to fight human trafficking and they've got access to data and to uh analysts and and strategists and and things that you know the police department just doesn't have access to uh here's how he explained it to me typically what happens in a human trafficking investigation is you find somebody on back page you call some young lady up to your hotel room to have sex They want to make sure you're not a cop, stripped down, whatever. And and then finally, the guys come in the other door, bust open, uh, bust in, you're under arrest. So that young lady, they're arrested. And now they're going into the system as a suspect to the police, as a defendant to the courts and to the jury. It could range anything from home record to whore. That indignation of going through the court system, which is more pain for that victim. What the Crime Commission does is we look at the communication pathways uh, we reason that it's not it's not much different from drug trafficking in the way of I have something I need to sell and I need to communicate that to the buyer. So we are working with uh, some software developed out of MIT, Carnegie Mellon. We start looking at those pathways, those communication pathways that allows the seller to, to notify the buyer. I got what you're looking for. Um, they use certain words, code words. They, uh, you obviously can't come straight out, not even on back page of Craigslist and say, I got a 12 year old girl to sell. You can't, <laughs> you can't do that. But there are certain terms that they use. And then, and then the phone numbers associated, because remember, not only do I have to let you know I have what, 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 you're, what you're looking for, I have to provide a mechanism for you to contact me to tell me you want to buy my product. In this case, it's young folks doing sex acts. So we looked at those using Uh, The software, not just one, but several that we layer on top of each other. Our analysts do that. It gives us an idea. Who is this organization? 
and it could be based off a phone number. The software allows us to go back in time to look at how often has this phone number been used on Backpage, on Craigslist. Uh, what were the pictures associated with it around the country? And you know what we found? We found some of the same pictures and the same numbers going around the country to various states, Detroit, Chicago, Florida, wherever that year's Super Bowl was or is. Hmm, why is that? They're following major events. Uh, so we were able to do that, start layering data. And our first success was a young, uh, I don't even know she was young. I don't even know the lady out of uh, Madison Heights. We called her the Madison Heights, madam. We identified about 230 some odd women that, that she was running. So we identified the structure. And then we gave the structure itself, uh, who she was. It took several uh, uh, layers of data to identify her. Uh, how many people are in this structure? Because the same tools that they use in the military to, to, to identify ISIS structures. Who's your leaders? Who's your hard target? Center of gravity. That's what we use. Cops don't do that. Cops are trained to do two things. Criminal investigation, traffic enforcement. And everything they do <laughs> is, is in support of those two objectives. They're not intelligence analysts. So now you're going after the organization. You know what it looks like. You know where they operate. You know who the victims are. In this case, these are the girls or young folks that are, that are doing the sex uh, for, for, for money. So it puts law enforcement in a better position to go after human trafficking organizations instead of doing the frontal approach where you get a knock on the door, come on in and everybody bust through the door. You know, I think it's worth pointing out that uh, Deputy Director Stafford, he's actually a former cop. He was uh, on the police force for a number of years. And yeah, and so I know that I just read recently an article about uh, Detroit. Uh, they're investing $1.5 million that they receive from the Department of Justice. Uh, to hire 15 more officers for a task force yeah, they're putting just one. to just to stop this yep so yeah man that's 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 great because i mean i mean geez what he's um, detailing is incredible what would what would public service announcements do for this well, so that's a good question because, uh, you know, where the education component and, and the recognition component uh, really plays a factor is with hotel staff because, not surprisingly, a hotel is where a lot of this happens. Well, I'm thinking I'm thinking Uber drivers. Yeah? Because... Anybody who could recognize it. Any, anybody who could recognize it and, 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 and give them some training as yep. to... As to what happens. Well, so I asked, uh, you know, about that and... and um, you know, Deputy Director Stafford, he told me about how hotel staff, and maybe you're right, maybe even Uber staff or, or some of the other people that are tangential and, and would be related. Because Uber drivers pick up these these girls yep. at their their work location, wherever they do the job, right. and usually take them back to their madam or pimp. Yeah. Or wherever they or wherever they're storing them. Well, here's what he told me. Right. There is training out there for hotel managers and workers that will help them identify instances of human trafficking. You got guys hanging out outside a room. Hmm. That's odd. Why are they all hanging out that one room? The cleaning staff goes, goes in there and finds a whole uh, number of used condoms. Uh, how did they pay for the room? What's the age uh, of the men hanging out? Or maybe the, the person who paid for Did they pay in cash? Or did they use a credit card? Uh, there's a you, you can the training will allow you to identify whether you have somebody in there, whether it's, uh, excuse the term, a bunch of swingers or whether you have somebody who is af obviously being trafficked. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, I think some of those signs are things that. Uh, yeah, because what they're doing, uh, the hotels, it's good. It's good to have that stuff. But they're getting from one place to another um, unless they're getting the guys to come to the hotels. What, uh, but, you know, a lot of this is. In call, out call, trying to get them, you know, like doctor's visits type of thing. I mean, does, right. does a time, do they do house calls type right. of thing? Yeah. And I know Uber is a convenient way for them to traffic, speaking of traffic, to, to move these girls or boys around um, and keep it really anonymous. Right. I mean, it, 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 they could... You know, you know for a fact that uh, not every one, every one of those Uber accounts come with a, the correct picture. I mean, as much as they try to do that, I mean, they, there's ways to work around that. Or maybe you could have two people together. There's no limit on if one of the guys kind of looks like the profile picture. You know, maybe that's the, maybe that's the pimp that drives them around. But it keeps everything sort of anonymous. Yeah. They, and, and I think there's signs that you can look for, too. I mean, they were talking about how when you see, in particular, a teenager who is uh, – 
dressed, o- overdressed for their age, not dressed age appropriately or not made up uh, age appropriately or showing signs of wealth that uh, may not be age appropriate, you know, indicates that there's somebody else there. Yeah, I mean, I think that's something that uh, some of these drivers could Well, could I have two teenage daughters, and I think they all dress inappropriately so, <laughs> because, because yeah. they're daughters. <laughs> well, look, the, uh, the other person I talked to was Noelle Schiffer. She's the president, uh, like I said, of the Junior League of Birmingham, Michigan. Uh, it's uh, an organization that is very involved uh, in this fight uh, against human trafficking. And she told me a little bit about the legislative efforts, the things that they're doing on a state level. So from a statewide perspective, our focus has been trying to work with our local elected officials here in Michigan from a legislative perspective to pass different packages of bills that do essentially two things. Number one, They create a safe harbor for the survivors of child trafficking. So they have more privacy. As Ellis mentioned, they're not going to be arrested immediately. And many of our efforts are focused around their privacy and their safety. The second focus of that is to make it more disadvantageous for the people that perpetrate these crimes to do business in Michigan. So it used to be that um, international traffic was a federal crime, so there was there was no beef in our laws to penalize this in Michigan. We passed a comprehensive package of bills to help make the laws gender neutral, as well as increase the ability um, to penalize these people. Now, not everything that... Uh the Junior League is doing is on the state level or or on the legislative effort. They're they're also doing some things uh, on the ground. She told me about those efforts as well. We work in conjunction um, with an organization called SOAP, Save Our Adolescents from Prostitution, which was founded by a wonderful woman named Teresa Flores, who was able to parlay her experience of being trafficked in the 1980s in Birmingham into an organization that helps Uh, increase awareness of child trafficking and rescue victims. So soap takes the small soaps that you see in the hotel. We wrap them with a wrapper that has the Polaris human trafficking number on it. And we go out to hotels and educate them in advance of some of the events that uh, Ellis mentioned. And try to get the hotel workers to understand if they see women who are ages 12 to 17, they have tattoos, they have expensive things, their nails are done, they're on their phones, there's never any parents present, there might be an older adult lurking around them to call the human trafficking line. You know, and she mentions that human trafficking uh, hotline. Uh, That number, by the way, uh, if you happen to know anybody or you happen to see anything, uh, is 1-888-373-7888. It's actually the same thing, both frontwards and backwards. Uh, So it's 1-888-373-7888. Last question I asked was, what can people do? Uh, And this was the answer that I got. This is going on all around you. Michigan is one of the top six states in the nation for human trafficking. What can you do about it? We would encourage people to call law enforcement, to call 911. And a lot of people don't want to get involved, but you have to understand that these women are there against their will because they have been emotionally, physically and sexually coerced. And and look, there's something else you can do. Well, and this is a, you know, it's a gritty issue. Yeah. I, I mean, it, it's not a pretty issue. Uh, but if you want to know more about it, like we said, there's going to be a very special screening uh, of this documentary called Break the Chain. Uh, it's all about human trafficking in Michigan. It's happening on Tuesday, February 27th at the Maple Theater in Bloomfield Hills. There's going to be a Q&A with the director afterwards. Tickets are $10. Uh, and all the proceeds are going to benefit the Detroit Crime Commission's anti-human trafficking initiative. Uh, you know, exactly what Ellis Stafford is is working on and heading up uh, those efforts over there. Uh, and they're asking that you please bring gently used teen clothing and full-sized hygiene products that will be donated to uh, Vista Maria if you're coming. And and once again, uh, if this is something that you see, the hotline number is one 888 
888-888-7888. Coming up in just a few minutes, uh, we're going to talk to the editor of Eater Detroit. The Deep Breathe. The Deep Breathe. Sports Report. All right, Mike, what's going on in the world of sports? Well, Seth, the Pistons, they're back from their all-star break, man. And they're going to take on uh, the tough Boston Celtics uh, before heading on the road for two games against the Charlotte Hornets and the Toronto Raptors. Very big. They're, they're kind of hanging on the cusp of the playoff picture, the bubble. So they have to get it together. Uh, our beloved Red Wings, uh, they're back. At, well, they're, they've been in action. They were actually playing while the Pistons are off being lazy and stuff. Uh, the Wings are... Uh, all start break. <laughs> yeah, but whatever. They could be out working, out, working on their dribbles, guys. <laughs> work on your dribbles. Is, is, that their, is, that their, is that their problem? Their dribbles? Yeah, the dribbles. Yeah, the dribbles. Yeah. It's always the dribbling. Yes, the trouble with dribbles. Isn't that a <laughs> Star Trek? <laughs> <laughs> you didn't think uh, I knew that, did you? The that, wings. Have, <laughs> that, that, that was a nice blurred uh, I'm reference just saying, there. Brother, that, was, uh, <laughs> that was nicely done, I'm a done, witty sir. individual. I get paid for this. Uh, the wings have two at home against the Buffalo Sabres and the <laughs> Carolina Carolina Hurricane before uh, heading to the Big Apple to take on the Rangers. Uh, the Spartans, Michigan State Spartans men's basketball, they're closing out their season. Their last regular season game is this week against the always tough Wisconsin Badgers, and then they go into the Big Ten's tournament for seeding and all of that. And the Wolverines, Michigan Wolverines, their men's basketball team, had a huge victory last Sunday against the eighth-ranked Ohio Buckeyes. Kind of put a spanking on them at home. Well, they'll close out their regular season on the road against the Penn State Nittany Lions and the Maryland Terrapins. But, big drum roll. All right, that's pretty good. <laughs> the boys of summer, they're back. La Tigres. Los Tigres. That's Spanish for Tigers. The Tigers. I, I knew that. All right, cool. Los Tigres, they're t- kicking off their exhibition season this week. This Thursday, actually, as they usually do. Every year, they play against the uh, Southern, Florida Southern University Moccasins, the Mocs. The so they're gonna play. It. They're gonna play. It. They play them the first game every year. Huh, sometimes cool. they win. Sometimes they lose. Probably gonna lose this year. <laughs> Tigers. I don't know who's on that team. Uh, Cabrera, um, Martinez, uh, Winky, Victor Martinez, Winky, Inky, and Clyde. That's all yeah. I know. Oh man. man, I don't. That's all I know. But yeah, man, that's sports. Uh, hey, wait a minute. You gonna skip the Olympics there? Oh yeah, the Olympics. Uh, he does. He's not winning. an Olympics Listen, fan. Man, Are you an Olympics fan, winter. Mark? Are you? I like the Olympics. I'm a, I'm a summer Olympics I, dude, I can't man. I can't turn the TV off. It's on I 24 hours a day. I can't relate to any of it. Oh, what really? You, you can't relate? You've never slipped on the ice? I don't. I don't sled. I don't ski. I don't ice skate. I don't mogul. I don't... Uh, I luge at least three times a week. <laughs> well, I luge, but that's just to make sure my skin is always glowing. <laughs> that's why I luge. How about hockey? They don't even have the pros in it. Oh, that's still hockey. Ugh. Okay, Canadian football. Do you watch, it's still football. Do you watch, no, college, do you watch college basketball? Yeah. Yeah, well, they don't have the pros in it. <laughs> Good, Good point. point. Good, Good point. point. Uh, but uh, I can relate to college <laughs> basketball. <laughs> All right. All I know is my favorite expression now is shib sibs. I just like saying that. Shib sibs. Shib yeah. sibs. Yeah, I got a great uh, spring training story for you, though, since you can relate to baseball. Yes. Did you hear the trick they played on uh, Garden Hire today? No. The new manager uh, has a habit of calling all the guys. He's got to learn all the new players, so he doesn't know all their names. Um, and the Tigers have uniforms that have their names on their back. So he's calling, hey, buddy, buddy, buddy. And so, like, three of the players had buddy put on the back of their shirts. <laughs> <laughs> so when he calls out buddy, they all turn. And they've all been cut. So No, 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 not the, it's, it's Fulmer and Zimmerman. And, oh, mean, yeah, so they, they can get, get away with they it. They can get away with it, yeah. Who else can afford to have their own jerseys made yeah, up with exactly. a different name on it? I mean, yeah, the rookies aren't going to be doing this. He's like, so. you guys are a card. <laughs> All right, hang tight. We're going to take a look at concerts happening in the Detroit area next. The D. 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 The D. Three. Food and drink. All right, Mark, are you an adventurous eater? Yeah. You are? Oh, absolutely. Because one of the things that we have clearly established in this podcast is that, uh, well, I'm the more adventurous eater of the two of us over here. That Mike and is, uh, well, my, and my doctor, My doctor limits uh, that a little bit. I'm adventurous as I can be with my doctor and my wife's permission. But you like to try new things. You like to go out sure. and try. Wait, time out, time out, time out. Do you drink stuff with cucumbers in it? <laughs> 
<laughs> like uh, water or other cocktails, stuff. Cocktails, gin. Well, first of all, they, cucumbers is a bad example. Think of because I love cucumbers. So think of something other than cucumbers. Well, no, I, I, I need. I will. I will, I will. You first put, of all, I won't eat a cucumber. Period. I have something. That, I'm like cats. I don't like cucumbers. <laughs> Do cu- cats not like cucumbers? No, they scare them. Well, they scare you ever me see too. Those videos for a different on, reason. on YouTube with the cats jumping around, cucumbers. They have a cucumber on the floor. A person have a, you know, just jump around it. I got a cat and a cell phone. I got to start. Uh, I got to start making videos. I guess. Right. <laughs> He's making fun of me because I like cucumber cocktails. Anyway, have you had cucumber ranch dressing? <laughs> I won't eat ranch dressing. Listen, cucumber cocktail is just cucumber juice, Seth. That's all it is. Yeah, I love right. the it's I love brine. I loved the cucumber episode of Big Bang Theory. That was just oh boy, <laughs> it's getting away from us here, guys. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You just listed three things that I hate: cucumbers, ranch dressing, and the Big Bang. All right. Theory. Well, here's what we did, though. Here's what we did. I brought somebody to hopefully make some recommendations because we yes, got to get you out to some, find some new places to eat. We have a very special guest in studio with us today. Uh, she is the editor of Eater Detroit, uh, Brenna Hauk. Thank you so much for joining us. Happy to be here. <laughs> <laughs> you want to weigh in on the cucumber cocktail debate? Um, I mean, Come on, I like a nice, refreshing cucumber <sighs> cocktail, although I can't think of any in particular. I mean, like... Cucumber water is delicious, but I know that some people just really can't stand cucumber, so oh. I, 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 I respect that. But you, you don't like anything with in, wa- in, in a cocktail? Just I, uh, like no, no, just, I, liquor? Listen, if it's no. going to be fruit, yes. Okay. But to put cucumbers in it? <laughs> I don't like, you know, like, why do people put tomatoes and pickles and all of that mm-hmm. that's for sandwiches why are you putting that in your drink i like i like a, a cocktail where there's food alongside it I'm like i her. want a meal with my cocktail yes. so uh, like her. i like a bloody mary with like like a pickle in it and like some celery something that i can eat while i'm waiting for my food yeah, i'd just <laughs> rather separate the two i'd rather get drunk and then eat a meal but anyway <laughs> That's what you're here for. You're tell me where to go to eat these meals while I'm getting drunk. I like a stout with a pretzel. <laughs> <laughs> well, Eater Detroit, for anybody who doesn't know, is is a fantastic website for everything that's going on in terms of restaurant news and bar news. And really, I, I mean, I check it out all the time to find out what's going on in, in the scene. So I'm really excited that you're here because... You know, we we talk about food and drink, and we talk about, frankly, Detroit's renaissance quite a bit on this podcast. And I think that's one of the places where you're really seeing it, right? Um, yeah, I mean, there's a ton going on in food and drink right now, um, especially in the past five years or so. Uh, the restaurant scene in Detroit has really changed significantly, and I think that that's a lot of times how people interact with Detroit now. Um especially if they haven't been here before is they like hear about the food and drink scene and then they come here and they want to like experience other things. And I think that that's really, it's an exciting time to be writing about food and drink in the city. Yeah. I mean, is that something you see the food tourism, the people, and where do you tell people to go if they are from? (laughs) Um, I tell them to go to the eater 38. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so, so what is that for people who don't uh, know? So the Eater 38 is like our essential restaurants, but we like change it. I mean, I think people think of that as being like the definitive essential restaurant, you know, because that has that weighty term. But um, <laughs> we change it. We change it pretty regularly. And it's kind of designed for people who maybe want to go somewhere that's been here for a really long time, but they also want to try something maybe a little bit newer and fresher. Uh, The general rule for the Eater 38 is that things have to be on there for six months or or they have to be six months old at least to be on the Eater 38 and to be like kind of, and six months is like, pretty short short i think i i sometimes i i wait a year before i'll keep put something on there because like i want room we talk a lot about new restaurants and i want room for like things that are that have been right have proven themselves is is this all high end or is it no it's a mixture it's like all sorts of things you can 38 would be mid-level right you'd have the 3022 for the low end and then the, the, the 3045 well, the, 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 the 38 would be for the mid-level ones this I is mean, detroit come on yeah i i i don't ascribe to the fact that like everything has to be expensive when you go out and like i i mean i'm a food writer and that's i mean i 
can go out to eat, but like I'm not always going to like the most expensive fancy place. Like we have taquerias on there and uh, we have pizza places and things, things that are casual as well as things that are a little bit more high end if people are going out and looking for that as well. So what have you seen open up already in 2018 that uh, you're excited about? <laughs> I mean, there it's always winter is really hard for for restaurant openings, so it's always a little bit slow to come. I guess I'm I was really excited to see Flowers of Vietnam reopen again. I think that that was probably the most exciting one. What's that? Um, it's a Vietnamese restaurant. Um, it's run by the chef called named George Azar. Um, it's in Southwest Detroit, just um, a block or so away from um, from Clark Park. And uh, he was actually open last year, or he opened in 2016. Uh, and he ran a pop-up out of Verner Coney Island for a while, and he would just open on the weekends. Um, he had just, like, really great Vietnamese food um, and Vietnamese-influenced food. Uh, he has these, like, really delicious egg cream, cream coffees that you get at the end of the meal. Um, that and they have, and he kind of closed and reopened again and uh, kind of remodeled the space. And so it's larger now and it's got like a cocktail bar, a full cocktail bar. And they have like great cocktails, but also good beer and wine as well. Um, and I think that that's also like a nice place where like you can interact. Like they have um, like kind of like draft beers and stuff and like things that are not very expensive and then they also have like higher end stuff that you can get there so you can kind of mix and match and so it's an easy place to go yeah, i'm all over that <laughs> <laughs> you want to go yeah i'll go is, is that something you see often where chefs start with a pop-up or they start with a food truck does, uh, um, does that happen here or i mean i think that, that happens everywhere yeah and um i i think the thing that people maybe people realize it a little bit more now because I think people are like really interested in food in a more in-depth way than they used to be. But like, I don't think that people realize how much it costs to open a restaurant and to get it started and to even get to the point where it's open. Um, I, and so a lot of times chefs will like pop up at places. They want to like get to know what their customer is looking for and to also kind of like build up the name of their restaurant before, um, they open because then they kind of have like that fan base already in place right. beforehand. Um, it's also, I mean, food trucks, it's a much lower uh, cost to start a food truck, uh, significantly lower. Kind of like Checkered Bar, they have a regular uh, pop up series. Right. It's called mm -hmm. Pop. These have different uh, chefs come in and, you know, have different themes like breakfast theme or burger or whatever, and they do it throughout the year. Talk to us a little bit about the, the neighborhoods. Are you seeing particular neighborhoods uh, start to see new restaurants open up? Oh, most certainly. I mean, I think that Grandmont Rosedale is an area that's getting more restaurants. Um, I Max L. Hardy is a chef who came in. He actually had three restaurants already planned when he came in, uh, came back to Detroit and uh, he, his first one opened last summer uh, named River Bistro. Um, and then there, you also saw a... Is that in Rosemont? Uh, that was in Rosedale. Rosedale, I mean. Or Rosedale right. Park. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then uh, nearby that, you we got a, a second location of Detroit Vegan Soul opened in that area. And I think that there's more stuff in the works. There's a brewery that's supposed to be opening there in that area. And I think that they just got kind of like past one of their roadblocks that was kind of holding up the, the opening of that. Is that, the, um, is that the Grand River Fenkel area of that? Or is that no, more down by Schoolcraft? And, uh, um, it is in, in Northwest Detroit. Yeah, it's, it's along Grand River. Okay. Um, and then... Uh, it, I'm trying to think of what would be a location that would be a good landmark for that. Um, but I guess the other neighborhood that I would say would be Jefferson Chalmers is looking like there's been quite a few new restaurant developments and other developments in that area recently. I think that there's um, a group that's really trying to kind of um, kickstart some development in that neighborhood. And so, and they have this really great kind of downtown walkable. Yep area 
Um, and so you're seeing a lot of uh, bars and restaurants trying to open there. And um, that's something that I'm really excited for because that's just like a beautiful neighborhood in, in general. That's a, that's a great neighborhood. That's a gold mine waiting to happen. So um, Norma G's uh, is a food truck that is opening a restaurant in that neighborhood. It's like a Caribbean restaurant. Um, and that should be opening soon. Um, I mean, things are are slow to develop though because again it's very expensive to open a restaurant and so a lot of times like you're just waiting on your contractors or <laughs> you're waiting on more funding or these other things you mentioned the roadblocks is does this city make it difficult to open a restaurant or or no or what are the biggest challenges um i aside mean from money yes and no i think that <laughs> i get the impression and it may be not necessarily the case, but like it depends on like where where you're opening that things might be a little bit easier. And um, it also depends like if you're opening in a building that needs a significant amount of work to right. it already, then right. like that's just going to take longer. You got to get it up um, to code yeah. and then add all your. If rentals. you're buying like a, a, or if you're just renting from like Bedrock and they already like built a box for you just to like put a restaurant into, then that's going to be a lot quicker to open than something else. But like it, it's also because there are so many restaurants opening in the city, especially in the summer, you'll see a lot of like long wait times where uh, people will schedule their inspections and maybe something goes wrong and it's really hard to get reinspected quickly to open. You have to wait a long time because there's so many rest restaurants that are opening and waiting. You know there's a lot of restaurants opening in a town <laughs> when the uh, restaurant inspector is wearing a cape. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, uh, stick around for a few minutes, will you? Because we want to talk to you about this more. Plus, I know that James Beard, uh, what, what is it, the semifinalists were just Yeah, announced? this is the, the long list, they yes. call it. <laughs> so, so we want to find out if anybody from uh, the Detroit area is on that list as well. Uh, so hang out with us for a few minutes. This is the D, 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 D. Concert Calendar. Before we get back into food, let's take a quick look at the uh, concerts that are happening around town. On Wednesday, February 21st, you've got R. Kelly and Charlie Wilson going to be at Little Caesars Arena. Or, the Hara. Yeah, the Hara. That's, Hot uh, Ready Arena. Can you can you <laughs> write about that in either Detroit and maybe see if you can make that take Please, off? Please, just put, it, put a little trademark symbol by it and put my name. Pizza. It belongs to me. <laughs> Thursday, February 22nd, you've got uh, Dennis Coffey performing Jazz on the Streets of Old Detroit at the Detroit Historical Museum, an unusual uh, venue to go see some music yeah. at. Friday, February 23rd, you've got Los Temerarios at the Fillmore. Saturday, February 24th, you've got DJ Steve Aoki at the Royal Oak Music Theater. Oh, snap. Yeah, it's going to be yeah, a good man. show. is uh, going to be at the Fillmore. Also, uh, you've got uh, Little Zan at El Club. I, I always want to pronounce it like El Club. I, I know, I'm, El Club. That's El Club. what we call yeah. it at our that's, house. That's right. Yeah. I, I, he was pronouncing like he's German. El Club. El Club. Like it's the Spanish in me. I, the French I can't do. Uh, also, you've got classic albums live. Led Zeppelin two happening at the uh, Chrysler Theater on Sunday, February twenty fifth. You've got the Mowgli's at the Pike Room. Monday, February twenty sixth. You've got Deer Tick at the Magic Stick, and Steve Winwood at the Fox Theater. And on Tuesday, February twenty seventh, you've got Tyler the Creator. I might go see that. Yeah. Yeah, I like Tyler. At uh, the Masonic He's Temple dope. Theater. Uh, also, a uh, big announcement on Thursday. The Kresge Foundation named Detroit jazz musician Wendell Harrison its 2017 eminent artist. This guy's oh, wow. 75 years old. He plays a tenor sax and clarinet, but he does a lot more than that. He's also a composer, a band leader, an educator. Uh, he even founded his own record label at one point. Uh, he gets a $50,000 prize. No strings attached, can do whatever he wants with it. That's not bad, right? That's not bad for a 75-year-old. That's pretty good. I'm going to Disney World if I don't <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to eat at Detroit, maybe with some restaurants <laughs> I want to go check out. And unfortunately, he has no time to enjoy it because they named him 2017 Eminent Artist in 2018. But <laughs> right. <laughs> better luck next time. Uh, coming up in just a, a few moments, we've still got to see whether you can answer my Nain Rouge pop quiz. I don't know if you can do it. Keep up with us. The D. Download our mobile app. The D. Three. We're here with Brenna Hauk. She is the editor of Eater Detroit. Uh, great website if you're looking for basically all restaurant news, bar news, everything. I'm looking at it now on my phone. I'm yeah. going to look at it. 
<laughs> I need Find to know what your you 38 is. Yeah, yeah. The Eater 38. You talk to us about uh, the Eater Young Guns, because I know that's the thing that you guys do, right? Yeah, so um, every year, Eater, uh, we're not just a local site, we're a national site as well, and we have lots of different cities. Um, so we cover the whole country and parts of the world. Uh, but uh, every year, we ask for nominations of up-and-coming uh chefs, bartenders, really anything under the sun. You could be a general manager at a restaurant um, that are under 30 years old um, and uh, kind of want to <laughs> become uh, bigger in the industry. So um, I, it's, it's kind of that, a, that it has opened. Right. That was a, a poor way of putting it, but like <laughs> that, that, th those nominations opened up today, um, and uh, we're accepting them for I think a month or so, um, and then we kind of start to narrow those down. So uh, we're always looking for new uh, and up and coming chefs and other people in the industry from Detroit. We've had. Uh, I think four now um, from the area and they've all gone on and done cool things so I'm excited now, could I do it because I make a pretty mean grilled cheese uh, maybe I don't know I put bacon on it <laughs> hey, no cucumber no nomination no cu oh man <laughs> hey, who are some of the, the people who made the list in the yeah past? so um, uh, Lisa Ludwinski at uh, Sister Pie one year we had um, we yeah. had Garrett Lupar. We, we need her. We need to get Sister Pie on the podcast because that name keeps keeps coming up. That's come up several times. Sister Pie is delicious and wonderful, and you should go and get <laughs> sold. And <laughs> pie, pie cookies, delicious, wonderful, yeah. and Punchki on Punchki Day next year. Yes, nice. um, that's that's my plug for for Sister Pie. Um, it's just a a lovely place. Um, and uh, yeah, and we've had Elias Majid at um, Eli T in Birmingham last year. Um, and we um, have had bartenders in the past. And yeah. Is there a Detroit cuisine? I mean, besides Coney's, you know, what are the sort of the signature dishes or the signature types of cuisines uh, do you see? Corned beef egg rolls. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is a thing. <laughs> That is a thing yeah. that I never really use. Asian corned beef. Right. Yeah. Where, where do I get those? That sounds good. At Asian oh. corned beef. Right. <laughs> really? So multiple places. It's not yeah, like Yeah, they have like several satellite locations. and uh, uh, It's called Asian corned beef. It's called Asian corned yeah. beef. Really? Yeah, We're not it was original, like invented. Man. We're not original. There, <laughs> yeah. Detroit, no. Detroit had two, Detroit had two um, cuisines that caught on. Uh, one lasted quite a while and they may still eat it now and that was frog legs really really that, that's oh because it's a french thing yeah right? that's from detroit and the other one was muskrat muskrat didn't really right muskrat really didn't take i but think that there's a, like a muskrat feast in down river yes, yes, yes there something? is yeah I've, but yes there yeah. is <laughs> for what what holiday is it it wasn't any holiday we we learned that in michigan history when i was in school that uh frog legs and um and muskrat were two. Yeah, but there's there's a culinary delight. Holiday. No, there might be a holiday. I just don't yeah. know about it. Like a Catholic holiday. That's a homework. That's a homework assignment. Oh. <laughs> you're right. You're right because yes. muskrat isn't considered. You're right. It has to do they, with that's Lent. That's the only one. That's right for Lent. That's, right, that's for the Lent. only thing they came. They we, can only we eat muskrat. That, that, Detroit that came up. Detroiters. Yeah, yeah, we did. Yeah. That, that, that sounded familiar. Yeah. yeah. I don't remember who told us about that, but oh, somebody God. did. Yeah, that's right. I, I don't know. That. I probably won't eat that either. All right, I'm, I'm going to find some muskrat uh, recipes and I'll send them to you. Muskrat spam. So that's not the only list of nominations. We were talking also about the James. Beard nominations. Yeah, so the James Beards, they're like kind of the, basically the Oscars for the restaurant industry. <laughs> Keep um, Cooper's library away. <laughs> <laughs> and even though, like, I, I mean, we're, no, we're not Chicago, but we do have some really great candidates this year that were semi-finalists. They just released the list last week, um, and that's kind of the long list for the James Beard Awards uh, submissions, and then they'll narrow them down again to the finalist list. Um, the past several years, we've had a pretty good showing in the semi-finalist list, um, but not so much in the finalists uh, for a variety of it's reasons. It's an honor just to be nominated. Yeah, well, there were like <laughs> some some definite things. There was uh, last year um, there, Katoy was nominated, and then Katoy 
caught on fire now the next now, week. Now it's Takoy. <laughs> yeah, which is now it's changed names. Um, and yeah, and, and so we've kind of had some interesting uh, luck with that. But I, I, I feel good. Every year I feel good that maybe we'll, we'll move on to, to the next round. I was excited to see that. I mean, not to bring up Lisa Lewinsky again, but Lisa was on the list last year, the long list last year for um, for Baker, for the baking category. And she uh, is on that again. And, uh, and also Standby, which is a really wonderful cocktail bar and restaurant in downtown, is also there again for bar program. Um, Lisa, Lena Sarini um, is there. Um, she's nominated in a like an up and coming rising star chef category, um, and she is the pastry chef at Selden Standard. Um, and Lady of the House uh, in Corktown was nominated for uh, best new restaurant. This is another one I keep hearing about. Tell me about Lady in the House. Lady of the House is wonderful, and you should go. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay, so <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it doesn't take Mike. It doesn't take much for Mike uh, to get sold this on was, this was, Lady of the House is the one that everyone keeps on sending me emails complaining that they're not on the Eater Thirty Eight. And the last time I did the update, they weren't six months old yet. So I was, I just had to. So follow the rules, people. E- right? Yeah. Email them back and be like, be patient. They're still on the heat map. Um, but uh, Lady of the house is wonderful it's uh owned by chef kate williams um who was briefly the chef at um republic and she kind of helped open parks and rec a little bit and then she left to work on the secret project which ended up being lady of the house it was supposed to be in a different location and then it moved because again opening restaurants is hard hey cork sounds good um and she ended up at saint cc's um they bought the she and her silent partners bought the building um and they open last fall uh it's it's great it's like kind of like one of the nicer restaurants but what i really like about it is that you can go and you can get um like one of her they make this really wonderful bread and they have these wonderful spreads and you can get that and be like really satisfied with like a cocktail and like some toast with like uh, they they have shrimp butter, which I really like. Ooh. Um, I don't know what that is, but it sounds great. And then for dessert, she <laughs> has butter. these like yeah. wonderful potato donuts that they make from scratch there, oh, what? and they're like they have like this fried thyme on top, and it's just wonderful. You have to go. Um, and Field they trip. they do like these Coffee partnerships day. with other uh, their um, bar bar manager. Um, GM uh, Christian Satchel uh, came from a, a lot of bars in in the area, and he uh, just knows everyone in town. And I think they kind of they worked with Detroit City Distillery, and they made their own gin. And um, so it, it's it's cool. Do you really see cool that place. here? Is there like a like a godmother and godfather, like a chef that like lots of people came from or came up under? Oh, or? definitely. I mean, I think that. Um, uh, <laughs> Um, let me see. Not There's the, Michael Polson. Polson uh, oh, yeah. was uh, one that like a lot of chefs worked under. Um, I think Andy Holiday from Selden worked with him, and um, you should publish a family tree. Sarah Welsh did as well. I've always been interested in that yeah. because I, that that happens. You know what I mean? Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's like a coaching family tree, right? You know? Yeah. Well, they should. I mean, they should. Do, they've done it with the auto industry. They did it with the music industry. I mean, how everybody came down from John John Lee Hooker, yeah. you know, in in the, in the blues. I'll that bet you could do it with comedy, jazz, even. So. You know, like with the stand up comedy. You could. Probably. Yeah. yeah. I mean, my branch would probably but, be rotten. <laughs> but I you know, no, I still think though for a restaurant, so that would help. I think. Uh, if you saw the how these Who? people uh, came down from, or delineated from, or made right. changes, or took this and changed it, I yeah. smell an eater infographic. <laughs> Luciano <laughs> Del Signor and and Southfield also James Regato trained under him and like some other chefs. The chef at She Wolf, which is an upcoming restaurant, also. Well, I've got to graduate four more kids from college before I can eat out again. (laughs) (laughs) I'll be be following along for sure. Save your pennies. (laughs) Right. I I live through Seth. Well, let me ask because, you know, I am the new guy to the Detroit area. What are the, the, especially as we start getting into the spring and the summer and starts warming up, Mm -hmm. what are the foodie events that happen throughout the year that, you know, I should go check out? Food events. um, I mean, 
there's opening day <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> opening day <laughs> is when you avoid downtown <laughs> go somewhere not else. all the restaurants are downtown <laughs> <laughs> and uh, let's see I, I mean I think the Detroit Beer Festival is a really cool one at Easter Market that they have every year and that kind of pulls in like beer not just from the city but also like across the state um, and I think that um, there's some cocktail events and the name of it is escaping me now right now but like I there I think cocktail events are always kind of fun I love you get to like sample that. lots of different things which is nice um, we make so many wines here in Michigan there should be a wine festival I know there should be a wine festival we're finally getting some like wine bars which is nice and I feel like that must be coming next right is like a wine festival I would festival. think so I mean there's just so many bottlers here of wines yeah and um, wine and comedy yeah there you go oh I see it I see look at this no. you two have Cheese to get together after the show that's what we call it <laughs> No, <laughs> <laughs> well, Brianna Hauck, uh, editor of Eater Detroit, thank you so much for stopping by. It was absolutely yes. fantastic. Yeah, and, you're uh, awesome. Thanks. <laughs> this is the D. Detroit. This is the D. Brain. That's how we do it, Mark. Wow. Hey, it was all right. Yeah. Man, that was action packed. It was action, action packed. It was and, action packed. And, and some drama. And, and some, some drama. And some pain. That yeah. was serious. We got that deep there for a stuff. moment. Serious stuff. Hard for yeah, a comic man. to go through that whole thing, though. Yeah. I know. You got, it's, it's like, you know, when Robin Williams takes his dramatic turn. I, kind of I have two teenage daughters. It was very difficult yeah. to listen to. Uh, yeah, man. I believe that. I believe that. Uh, well, look, coming up in just a few moments, we are going to find out what you guys know about the name Rouge, if you can identify the false statement in our pop quiz. Before we get to that, I want to say thank you to our guest, uh, Brenna Hauck of Eater Detroit. Uh, thank you to her for stopping by. Also, Dr. Denarius. Dr. Hemphill, B. He was way young. I mean, we looked at his resume, and oh my he God. He was on some Doogie Howser stuff, man. He, he, like, he I, came in here and said, hi, guys. You know, you, you, Chew <laughs> a bubble gum with a little hat with a propeller on it. <laughs> Man. I'm just kidding, Dr. It's D. Like, yeah, there was like, no propeller on no, that. guy's yeah. the truth, and it's, it's great what he's doing, man. It's very inspirational. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Uh, also, speaking of inspirational, uh, Laura Swanson, the director of yes. Break the Chain. Go see that documentary film and do what you can uh, for that cause. Uh, Ellis Stafford as well. He's the deputy director over at the Detroit Crime Commission. And Noel Schieffer, the president of Junior League of Birmingham, Michigan, all working on the issue of human trafficking. So thank you to them. Please support them, do. please. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, also, thank you to Jack. And to our brand new intern, Spencer. Well, no, that's not aboard. how you say it. You have to say it like Hawk on Spencer for hire. Spencer. 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 All right. Well, welcome aboard. Spencer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, well, that's fine. Uh, a couple of other things. Uh, you can find our website over at thedebriefdetroit.com. While you're there, join the email list. We will send you a link of what's going on all around the city each and every week. You can find this podcast wherever you find your favorite podcast. While you're there, subscribe and leave a review. We are in uh, Apple Podcasts. We're in Spotify. We are in TuneIn. We are in Google Play Music. Stitcher, you name it. Uh, we We're even in Braille. I don't know if that's true. That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Didn't make any sense. I'm sorry I said it. <laughs> Workshop that. <laughs> I'm going to be like Fergie. I apologize. Yeah. Uh, no, we also gonna... have a mobile app, which you can download, uh, both on uh, iOS and on Android. Uh, and if you put on events, you've got announcements, you want us to know what's going on, you can send your announcements to press at the debriefdetroit.com. Okay, guys, are you ready? All right. Ba, ba, ba. I don't know why I still do, why I do that. Anyway, go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> He's easily <laughs> amused. <laughs> uh, here it is, the pop quiz. Three statements. Two of them are true. One of them is false. You have to identify the false one. This is about the Nain Rouge. Uh, statement number one. Detroit hip-hop artist Trick Trick recorded a battle rap song called Revenge of the Nain Rouge in which the Red Imp defeats rival rappers Trick Daddy, Young Berg, and Rick Ross. Statement number two. In 2015... Woodbury Wine, an importer of French and Italian wines, both based out of the metro Detroit area, introduced Nain Rouge Red. And statement number three, in Marvel Comics, a supervillain named Nain Rouge is the primary antagonist of the Great Lakes Avengers in its 2016 run. 
Well, I already know. Number two is right, so that's not that's not the incorrect one. You you I already I already, I already you know. Had that. a bottle? You've I, got I, it. I, I know. I know. <laughs> that, I know that. I know that there was a bottle of wine. We, we won't tell your doctor. Name, name yeah, right. some some juice cleanse. This right. is right. Yeah. Well, uh-huh. Wine is from grapes. Right? <laughs> that's right. That's what I told my wife. <laughs> um, Marvel Colic Super. So you guess first. Um, I think it's more likely that Marvel Comics would have a villain named Name Rouge than it would be that a Detroit hip hop artist would would include Name Rouge. I would I think it's more likely. I'm not gonna I don't know. So which one do you think is the incorrect answer? The hip hop. Okay, so the trick trick thing is incorrect. The trick trick is incorrect. Yeah. Okay. Uh I'm going to go with the Marvel Comics thing. I think that is incorrect. You think that's incorrect? I think that's incorrect. You're saying trick trick? You're saying Marvel Comics. Yes. All right, well Mike, this is for you. <laughs> What? I'm wrong? I was on like a three-week winning streak. The Marvel Comics thing is indeed true. Uh, The false one was uh, Trick Trick. Yeah, never had a a battle rap song. So so Mark was right. Congratulations, Mark. Nice. Sorry, Trick. (laughs) Sorry, Trick Trick. I thought I knew. But he's going to go out and record one now. Yeah, he should. I think that would be pretty cool. He's probably listening going, hey, that's a great idea. Somebody will give me some skid. I don't know. Uh, well, look, before we get out of here, you've got to give me some homework for next week. What uh, what are you going to have me go learn about? Well, sir, there was a uh, passing of a great uh, Detroit area businessman. He was, you know, people around here know this. Art Van S. Lander. Oh, this is the guy behind the, 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 the furniture area. store. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, yeah, I, I have bought a couch from him, but that's all I know. Yeah, it, he's more than just a couch, Seth. All right, I will... Go go learn about him. I will do my homework. I will go find out, and I will come back, and I will report on it. Hey, Mark. My dad used to work for Art Van. Did he really? Yep. What did he do? He was managed their stores in... Uh, Genesee County. All there right. weren't that many back then. Give me your dad's phone number. I'm going to need oh, it. I got my some dad, questions my dad, for it. My dad's passed away. Oh, so. Damn, this is going to be harder than I thought. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody get me a Ouija board. <laughs> Let's do that seance episode. <laughs> you go get the name Rouge, too. <laughs> right. Yeah. There you go. Well, Mark Sweetman, uh, thank you so much for, for yeah, man, hanging thanks, out with Mark. us. We had a lot of fun with you. We really appreciate yeah, it was you coming a lot of fun. And, uh, yeah. Bring, so. bring me back for when you don't have downer topics. <laughs> 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 We but will. We will only only bring you back for downer topics. <laughs> and next oh, week, <laughs> <laughs> just that's it. <laughs> and next week, we're going to have a brand new co-host uh, auditioning uh, as well. So we we just keep cycling them through and uh, letting people go for the ride. Uh, until then, have a great week and thanks for listening. The D Brave, your guide to Detroit's arts and entertainment scene.